And in the beginning, there was no barbecue society. There were, um, there, uh, start over. I'm Carolyn Wells. I'm one of the uh, co-founders of the Kansas City Barbecue Society, world's largest organization of barbecue and grilling enthusiasts. We have over 15,000 members worldwide, sanction over 400 contests a year, and have certified more than, I believe it's 20,000 judges right now. Um, we are all things barbecue, and we are Americana. When the Barbecue Society was started in 1985, its only rule was that none of it be taken seriously, and to do so was grounds for ejection. At the time, there were only three contests in the Kansas City area, uh, one being the American Royal Barbecue Contest, one the Great Lenexa Barbecue Battle, and one the Blue Springs Blaze Off. I ran a barbecue sauce in southeast Missouri, and people were always calling to see. I ran a barbecue sauce company in southeast Missouri, and people were always calling to see when the next contest was. There were no rules standardized, um, so we thought one night that we'd just start a club for uh, this small core of barbecue enthusiasts. It was Gary my husband, my late husband, uh, myself, and a friend named Rick Welch. Rick uh, decided after a couple of years that he wanted to pursue other pursuits, and so uh, Gary and I were left to carry on. Fairly early on, we started with about 30 members. Um, our dues were $12 a year, and for that, you got an occasional newsletter, eight and a half by 11, printed on both sides. Um, someone came to us and said, we want to have one of these contests. Can you do that? We said, sure. Uh, so we, Gary, appointed a board. Uh, we incorporated. We got a friend to write a program, We uh, a computer program. And we started pulling together rules from the three existing contests. Um, from that, we got a workable set, and then we started, we sanctioned the one contest, and then the others just started coming along. At the time, with so few contests, we had one called Spring Training, which was for members only, no prize money. Um, the entry fee was $69. It included the meats and a cooler, and we all went together on someone's farm, Dan Hague's farm, and had a cook-off. It was great fun, and it was getting ready for the season. The contest continued to grow. We had spring training for 10 years, and then abandoned it because there was just no demand for it anymore. Okay. At the end of our first year, we had about 100 members. Um, again, a very small, hardcore group from Kansas City, mainly. And uh, we just proceeded on having a very merry time. At the time, there was no prize money to speak of in contests. So we, um, we, we were all cooking for the fun, the camaraderie, and uh, and just trying to uh, outdo our personal best. The competition was serious, but it was also much more about fun at that point than the serious uh, business that has turned into 25 years later. We, we incorporated, we, uh, we had elections. We always had a New Year's party in January because we didn't want to rush into anything. It started out as a potluck. It then got a little more serious. And Al Lawson fixed wonderful ribs, and we all brought dishes. And we um, 
we named a team of the year based on their five best contests. We, they got a pair of hot pink tie-dyed overalls and a little trophy, and uh, that basically was it, with lots of bragging rights. And they were really proud of those. I know one person who still has his. All of us cookers got our start at Memphis in May, basically. Um, when I had been working for Wickers, the barbecue sauce company, Memphis was my major market. And uh, it, I went to Memphis in May in about 1980 and thought it was an absolute hoot. Um, sponsored a team there. But then these Kansas City teams started going as well. Um, there was another sanctioning organization in Texas called the IBCA. And early on, we uh, got together with the MIM, Memphis and May folks, and the IBCA folks, and decided we would have an annual meeting. We all thought our way was the best. If not, we would have changed it to be the best. But we also thought that we could cook under anyone's rules as long as we knew it was being fairly adjudicated. So we would take an annual field trip, usually in February, to a garden spot like Tulsa or Oak City, kind of in the middle, and to get together and discuss our rules for the year. Uh, the Chile people were very instrumental in getting this set up because it, back in the early days they had there had been so much internal strife between rival organizations that they almost killed the sport. And so Joanne Horton uh, suggested to us that we all keep an honest and open communication and dialogue. And by doing so, we could all coexist peacefully. Uh, I believe to this day that we continue to do that. In Texas, there are many more sanctioning organizations. Um, most of them are not quite as active as, as IBCA, but we're in, in the MBN has the Memphis Barbecue Network has split off from Memphis in May, but we're all still friends and we all continue to work together. Back during the same time, the National Barbecue Association started so we all for, went to their first convention in um, Las Vegas at the Hacienda Hotel the week before it was demolished. Uh, <laughs> it was great. We didn't have to worry about making a mess. But <laughs> we continued that open and honest dialogue and maintain that to this day. We also do networking with other food groups such as Slow Food, Southern Foodways Alliance, IACP, AIWF, uh, the Food and Wine people, promoting barbecue uh, as a viable food group. <laughs> there were still independent contests in Kansas City, uh, but as we as we grew, eventually they all converted over to KCBS sanctioned contests. The American Royal Barbecue Contest was our crown jewel, being one of the oldest in the in the competition network, but it also is a fundraiser for the American Royal Horse and Livestock Show. This contest is about oh, 32 years old now. Um, the Royal, as it's affectionately known, was the first contest to have an invitational. <laughs> um, working on the Royal was um, was a lot of fun, but it also was a lot of work. There was generally a um, a, a tinge of mistrust between the cookers and between the royal, who were 
the horse people, the horse and livestock people, and it was felt that they were more interested in having a fundraiser than a barbecue contest. Uh, we really got involved when the organizer came out at 9.30 on Saturday night and said there would be no awards uh, because there was a problem with the computer, with the tech, the program. It turns out that the programmer had programmed it for three-digit spaces and the teams had been assigned four-digit spaces. So he was trying to reprogram and tabulate at the same time. We picked up the judging cards the next morning at 7 o'clock and, um, and tabulated it on our program and were able to call the winners at 7 o'clock on Sunday night and let them know who won. Uh, from that point, we were pretty much drafted to be on the American Royal Steering Committee and it became a sanctioned contest. I was on that committee for 15 years, and the last year uh, our committee was able to net $420,000 for the American Royal Association. So it was a good run. We enjoyed it. It's still a sanctioned contest. It's still our crown jewel, but it's also the largest contest in the world, and uh, it was time for some new blood, and it has new blood. It's still a destination. It's an invitational contest, an open contest, a sauce contest, an expo, side dish contest, and a dessert contest. So there's, and a kid's queue. So it's pretty much something for everyone. Back in the early years, we got a call from a New York advertising agency who said that the they represented the Jack Daniels Distillery. They wanted to have, the Jack Daniels Distillery wanted to have a contest in Lynchburg because it was said that Mr. Jack was fond of barbecue. So my husband Gary flew down on uh, one day, had a one day meeting on it. They shook hands and decided that they would have an invitational world championship the last weekend in October or the fourth weekend in October. Um, and that has now been going on for 20, 21, 22 years. It's been a great association. We've gotten a lot of exposure from it. It's a lot of fun. And the Jack experience is something that uh, that is not to be taken lightly. This is the contest the teams would kill to get to. Um, and it's just a great gathering down in the holla, good folks, and it very much is a PR opportunity for Jack Daniels, uh, but it's, uh, it's also been very, very good for barbecue. So we're very glad to have had that association, and it sort of elevated us in the food world as well since they got national publicity. Um, at some point in the road, their barbecue got hot. At one of the National Barbecue Association conventions, I believe it was the one in Grapevine, Texas, um, there was a guy staying at the hotel who worked for Procter & Gamble. He was out for a walk of a morning, and he saw all these cookers there, and he was just fascinated. Uh, Brian Heineke was from Ohio. He was a fabulous man um, with a silver clipboard. He was my sounding board for years, my reality check. He was very logical, a market researcher for Procter & Gamble, and just a prince of a fellow. When he retired, he pretty much uh, his life became barbecue. Unfortunately, we lost him far too early, but he was a help to so many in the competition world, both cookers, judges, 
organizers. Um, he was a contest rep, a great logical thinker, and a dear, dear man who is still missed by many. Um, but we have so many people like Brian um, who it barbecue is all about food, family, fun, and friends. It's not a solitary pursuit. Barbecue people are, um, they're fun-loving. They see themselves as a couple of steps off center, and they like themselves that way. Um, this is their hobby. It's their, their um, bowling league, their bass tournament. It's their softball game. It's what they do for R&R. &R. They're... Um, They're fierce competitors, but they also, this is the only sport I've ever seen where people will, are all clapping for their fellow competitors when the awards are announced. So there's that element of camaraderie. We've really tried to make it a very family-friendly sport so that people can bring their kids, have kids cues, bring along the next generation of cookers, um, and do, and these people are great because they get together even when they're not barbecuing because they like each other. So it's like, it's a big family, mostly a happy family, and uh, and you get, a, it's a very social sport. <coughs> yeah. When we were a couple of years old, the Barbecue Society, that is, um, a guy named Joe Davidson, um, also known as Oklahoma Joe's, from Stillwater, Oklahoma, came to us and said he had a dream. That dream was to have 5% of the barbecue smoker market. That's all he wanted. Uh, he was an engineer. He had a manufacturing plant. So Joe decided he was going to be a supporter of the Barbecue Society. He gave us a cooker, which we, I think, raffled at the end of the year. Um, Joe had a contest in Stillwater, Oklahoma. He um, continued on that, that road until, um, until he was finally bought out by another company. And from then has gone, he's been in and out of the barbecue business, but remains in it uh, these some 20 years later. But it, at the time, it seems like competition barbecue KCBS style, of course, started in Kansas City, and it sort of went down the interstate. It went to Stillwater, Oklahoma. It went to um, Oak City, to Tulsa. Um, and headed on south, Wichita. Um, it went up to Des Moines. It went <laughs> asshole. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Minnesota. Now, Barbecue Lossel, uh, the great World Pork Expo, came to us and they wanted to have a contest. Well, we had four required meats. Those were uh, chicken, pork ribs, pork, and uh, rib, pork butter shoulder, and beef brisket. They really weren't too interested in promoting chicken and brisket at their contest. And so for them, we made an exception and proceeded a 20-year run with Barbecue Lossel, the World Pork Expo. Uh, lots more contests sprung up throughout Iowa, um, Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, uh, of course Missouri, and we were doing one actually in, way early on in Boston. At um, we, we did a contest in Boston at on the city town center square in front of Faneuil Hall. Um, there we met two of the judges, one Tony Stone 
and one George Sasser of Cookville, Tennessee. Tony was an instant um, soulmate. Um, he had the first KCBS contest east of the Mississippi River, and that contest continues to this day. More unfortunately, we lost Tony um, in September of this year, but his legacy lives on through his daughters and through the Cookville Cook-Off. Tony was a, a fabulous man, a fabulous cook, a great family man, a, a very astute politician in a good old boy way, and had a joie de vie that, uh, that was a joy to behold. He was, uh, I'm honored to consider him one of my best friends, and I'm, and um, he's still missed sorely, but again, his, his legacy lives on too. When Gary became ill, I uh, don't exactly remember what year it was, uh, from complications from diabetes, and he finally resigned, uh, Gary asked that Tony be appointed president of the Barbecue Society. He did, and he fulfilled that role until he termed out of the board. And then Mike Lake was appointed president, or was elected president by the board. And now um, Ms. Candy Weaver is president. So we have a woman president and a woman executive director with exactly the same initials. So we can cause a fair amount of havoc with that. But it's still fun. Um, when we got our thousandth member, we it, you, you have to remember that our dues were very low, that we bootstrapped everything we ever did, and we got our thousandth member, and I remember Gary writing the guy a letter congratulating him. He's still a member. Um, he said there was no prize for this, but that he wanted him to know that we were glad to have him. <laughs> In our second year, we had, there was a book published called The Passion of Barbecue. That was a project that Rick had spearheaded and Karen Adler, and it was published through Westport Press in Kansas City. It was recipes of the members of the Barbecue Society. That book, the royalties from that book, enabled us to buy uh, real stationery and envelopes and to upgrade our operation just a little bit. But we again, we were trying to do everything uh, based on funding from dues, which we wanted to be as reasonable as possible. In 1997, we published the Kansas City Barbecue Society cookbook, subtitle, Barbecue, It's Not Just for Breakfast Anymore. Uh, this labor of love was produced uh, the essayists were uh, myself, Artie Davis, Paul Kirk, and Janice Michelle Capito. Um, the book was put together by Favorite Recipes Press who, in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. And the year that it was published, the book earned a second place national award in the Tabasco Community Cookbook Awards. About Five years later, it was inducted, inducted into the Walter S. McElhaney Hall of Fame for community cookbooks, that which meant we'd sold over 100,000 copies of the cookbook. That put us into such a great position that we uh, got audited by the IRS. Uh, <laughs> it was okay. We came out all right. But we had gone so far beyond our mission that we um, we lost our 501c7 designation. Maybe we don't want to put this in there. You think? <coughs> our 501c7 designation applied for a 501c3, which is charitable and educational. Didn't get that, but we got a 501c4, which was for the good of the general public. Um, 
So we also formed a for-profit subsidiary, which um, <clears throat> handled cookbook sales from then on, so that we could uh, not endanger ourselves. Our publication, there is a monthly newsletter called the Kansas City Bull Sheet. Its um, initial tagline was, it just doesn't matter. <coughs> Sorry. Two years ago, we also published the uh, Kansas City Barbecue Society Cookbook 25th Anniversary Edition. Uh, our publisher for that was Andrews and McMill, or Universal Press Syndicate. Uh, it's enjoyed a uh, very good distribution and probably is going to lead to doing uh, an anniversary cookbook like every five years. It's members, recipes, vignettes, stories. Um, it's more than a barbecue cookbook. It tries to capture the spirit of who the people are and what they do and why they're so passionate about the subject of barbecue. It's um, it's a real funny genre. Um, and one of the places that barbecue is, has been in the past is it's been a second class food group. By its very nature, barbecue is taking a lowly cut of meat and making it into a work of art. But it was not highly regarded by the press or the elite. Um, in, either in New York or on the West Coast. The rise in competition barbecue, um, mainly because our members are such hams, they've all got strong opinions, they're slightly ridiculous, they're very colorful, they tell you their secrets but they'd have to kill you, uh, but they captured the eye of independent production companies. So the, the media has been incredibly kind to us and we've been pretty good to them, giving them something colorful to shoot that, and trying to capture the story of who we are and what we do. No other food group has uh, the dedication and passion that our competition cooks have. The when contests actually the explosion and growth of contests was much more noticeable. We had been growing at about five to seven percent a year in numbers of contests, but after 9/11 was when it really took off. Uh, oddly enough, that during 9/11, I was serving on a federal grand jury. And I was on my way to the courthouse. Uh, and the, the, the announcement came on the radio about the, the plane crashing into the Twin Towers. And uh, at first, no one caught on, obviously. But then, as the morning progressed, they, um, they ended up shutting. The, the courthouse went into lockdown. We evacuated. That weekend, there was a contest in Decatur, Alabama. Um, obviously, since the planes weren't flying, and I was one of the contest reps, Gary and I and our dog drove to uh, Decatur when they decided they would have the contest. This contest is on a beautiful park on the Tennessee River, and it was amazing to see everyone was still in shock but they wanted to be together with other people in a semi-normal setting. The children were still playing in the playground. The cookers were still cooking. People were eating barbecue. There were more terrible renditions of the Star Spangled Banner than you've ever heard. But it was, it was a gestalt moment for me. Uh, the, but it, it was the real cocooning, the bonding time and place where people wanted some semblance of normal life in a world gone uh, totally amok.